Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am Dr. Dustin Bird, Professor of Philosophy and Religion at the University of Olivet in Michigan. I'm also the Editor-in-Chief of Icbarosis Press and the Founder and Co-Director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. Today, uh, where our topic is the democratic response to far right and fascism, and we'll be discussing that with Dr. Rudolph J. Sieber. How are you doing, Rudy? Fine, thank you. Very good. So just a little bit of background, give us some context. In, in, in the recent years, the West and its peripheries have seen the rise of a variety of new <laughs> right-wing authoritarian populist movements. In the United States, Donald Trump's promise to halt the chaos of democracy, multiculturalism, pluralism, immigration, and progressive politics continues unabated as he runs again for the presidency. In Germany, the alternative for Deutschland continues its right-wing dream of forced migration of non-ethnic Germans out of Germany. In France, the anti-immigration parties, including the far-right National Rally Party, uh, led by Marine Le Pen, continues its call for re-migration of Arabs, Africans, and Muslims in general. In the Netherlands, the far-right Islamophobe Kurt Wilders has been elected to power on the promise reversing the Islamization of the Dutch. In Italy, the far-right Georgia Meloni remains firmly in power with her anti-immigration politics. The far-right elected dictator in Russia, Vladimir Putin, continues his special military operation against Ukraine, leaving cities, communities, and families decimated in the wake of his dream of a reconstituted Russian empire. And in Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu presides over the farthest right-wing government ever to be elected. Since Hamas's deadly attack on October 7, 2023, Israel has waged a genocidal air bombardment and ground assault on Gaza, which as of today has killed over 25,000 Palestinians, two thirds of which are women and children. And by sure, this, is, this number will grow. As a result of this conflict, a wave of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia has in, ensued in much of the West. On our university campuses, solidarity with Palestinian victims is skewed as anti-Semitism and support for Israel is interpreted as support for the genocide of Palestinians. Democracy, which is predicated on discourse and rationality, has been eclipsed and there is no shortage of right-wing populists, religious zealots, political operatives who are willing to take advantage of that situation for their own purposes. In our last discourse, we spoke of the fascist temptation with Dr. Rudolf Siebert. Today, we want to discuss the democratic resistance to this fascist creep, which we see playing out in so many areas of the world. Today, uh, I have with me, as I already said, Dr. Rudolf J. Siebert. He's a professor emeritus of religion and society in the comparative religion department at Western Michigan University, where he taught for over 54, where he taught for 54 years. Dr. Siebert is the author of over 30 books and over 100 articles on a variety of topics, such as the critical theory of religion, psychology of religion, Hegel, the Frankfurt School, liberation theology, and many other subjects. He has taught not only in the United States, but also in Canada, throughout Europe, Israel, and Japan. <clears throat> He's the founder and director of two international courses, the Future of Religion course in Dubrovnik, Croatia, and the Religion and Civil Society conference in Yalta, Ukraine. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, Dr. Siebert. Okay, you're welcome. So uh, we're going to be talking about democracy and the democratic uh, resistance to the, the move towards fascism or the right wing uh, push in many parts of the world. So let's start from the beginning when we're talking about democracy. Uh, what is democracy? Where did it originate? What does it entail? <clears throat> well, it's a very long story, of course. So an issue like democracy takes thousands of years in order to develop as far as the human species is concerned. So it particularly the notion of the universal had to develop. And maybe since 60,000 years ago, man was able to have universals, not only to think in singular objects, but to have species and uh, and uh, universal concepts of everything. And so one had to come to the idea of a concrete universal uh, in order to have democracy. And um, Kennedy thought that 
the uh, people in Athens had the first and the greatest democracy, and that this was a prototype of our democracy here. But um, of course, there were democracies before, even among Hebrew tribes, uh, they had democratic uh, periods. So, um, and also the uh, uh, Athenian democracy was rather problematic because they were 4,000 citizens who were real human beings, and then there were 100,000 slaves who fed them and who were not considered to be human beings at all. They were not included under the universal of uh, human beings. So, uh, th therefore, it was a rather problematic type of a thing. And that happened, of course, again, when we established our democracy here, when the fathers of the Constitution were doing their work, and outside there were the slaves who kept their, uh, their vehicles outside. And uh, then, of course, women were excluded, and people without property were excluded. So, um, the uh, idea of democracy developed only very slowly through centuries and centuries. And um, so one has to see that that makes it also precarious now when democracy once more is threatened. And it was threatened before, where people had monarchies and they had aristocracies and they had democracies and then democracy disappeared again and so on. And so we are in one of those periods where people have are dissatisfied with democracy and want to go back to a strong man. And you mentioned all these countries in which this has happened recently. Yeah, it's very similar. I mean, the Plato's Republic, when he talks about the, you know, the four worst forms of government, with democracy being the least worst form, and that moves down to oligarchy, and then that devolves down to democracy. And of course, democracy um, dissolves itself into tyranny because of the internal contradictions within democracy. Um, so certainly is the case that, you know, I think uh, a lot of people think democracies that are stable will last forever, but they're not always stable, and they don't always last forever, especially from, from the perspective of when there's a deficiency in material democracy. So what is the difference between a formal democracy and a material democracy? Well, formal democracy would mean the exchange of power like every four years or so, or that people vote. Um, democracy contains, of course, the elements of equality, the element of freedom, and the element of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. So democracy in the full sense would include a material democracy in the family too, economic democracy, co-determination by the workers in the corporation, which we don't have here, but which the workers have in Europe already. So um, that uh, the formal democracy is what we had here. And even that was threatened now by Trump, um, recently in the march on the Capitol. So, um, the uh, what is threatened now is formal democracy, material democracy we did not really have yet. So democ democracy is a task in progress. Wasn't it the case that um, Roosevelt was going to propose a, more of a material democracy that would give every American the right to housing, the right to a job, the right to clothes and food and things like this? That never came through. They never came through. But uh, most of all, he stopped the uh, um, fascist upheaval which we had before the Second World War here in the States, where um, Henry Ford was there and Lindbergh and then Father Coughlin. It was a very, and the Bund was a very strong fascist movement. And Roosevelt was able not only to stop the depression through the war, but also to stop that fascist movement. Uh, through the war and to uh, transform uh, the uh, Henry Ford so that he would then produce. And he, they, he would not have allowed Ford to produce war material if Ford had not allowed the Union. So um, there was uh, both was overcome the Depression and fascism was overcome at that time. The question is who will, through what, overcome it now? It always seemed to me like an Achilles heel of formal democracy that there was no material rights. I mean, that that is such a 
a give to the far right you know what i mean like when they're putting forth an, an alternative to formal um you know capitalistic democracy like our own where you don't have any material rights that the promise of material rights the promise of the end of the instability and people's means of, of of living and whatnot it always seemed like that if you wanted to cut off the far right you would have to have some kind of material rights because material rights were something that are oftentimes offered by fascist governments yeah well some of that was done by the new deal of course then the new deal which goes up to biden at this moment but the new deal is a bourgeois enterprise in order to have peace with the working class they made some concessions which sometimes look very similar to what social democracies do in europe um, but it is a bourgeois affair we are the only country without a labor party that is the most amazing thing that we do have little labor parties somewhere but they never were powerful enough really to gain gain the presidency or something like that so but um, we should you know we should be shocked somehow by the fact that we don't have a labor party and um, that even the third party ideas which we have now there is no labor party option there really so full democracy would presuppose in all these rights you talk about they would, could not be realized without a labor party very true very true so you have a history of living within uh two democracies one in when you were very young the weimar republic uh, and you saw that collapse. You were there. You were young, but you saw it collapse uh, into um, into fascist Germany. So what kind of democratic response did you witness during the rise of the Third Reich or even into the Third Reich? Yeah, well, I was, of course, I was six years old when Hitler came into power um, and I lived in Frankfurt. And one of my uh, first political experiences as a little fellow was that every Saturday in front of my window, uh, three people, three groups appeared. There was first the fascists were coming with a swastika, and then there was, were the communists coming with hammer and sickle, and then came the police in the middle on horses and beat up on both of them. And afterwards, there were all kinds of wounded people laying there, which were picked up and by the, by the uh, hospitals around. So um, that happened every Saturday. And I must say to my shame that I was interested in coming and looked forward to these events every Saturday. So, and of course, as soon as Hitler came into power in January 1933, the, uh, uh, then of course, things became orderly. That was of course his plan, law and order. So the whole show stopped. There were no communists anymore. They wandered into concentration camps and uh, the struggle was over. So that is how the Weimar Republic uh, collapsed. The reason why it collapsed, they thought that Germans had no experience in dem democratic rule and therefore it was not deeply rooted, the Weimar Republic, and therefore it did not uh, hold up. But Hitler's idea was, of course, what he attacked against was the large plurality of parties um, which fought against him. He ridiculed them in his speeches and so on and so. And of course, these uh, the masses of parties didn't get things done. That is very often the charge of the masses of the people. They think that it lasts too long, democracies last too long. And then finally, they don't uh, come with the results anyway. So um, that is then the reason why people move from the from democracy to or formal democracy, at least, to a fascist regime. <clears throat> and yes. it's, of course, at this moment again, it's a, a inclusive democratic people let all these immigrants come in. And that the fascist uh, counter push is now to get them all out again. They don't want to gas them anymore. They just want them to go home. And then th that's OK. I, I don't think they would stop there. But nevertheless, that's what they say always. Just go home and there will be peace. So uh, and uh, so we know what the cause is, why this fascist wave is uh, coming about in all these countries. 
<clears throat> there's always a certain level of instability in democracy and in that might make it less efficient uh, less orderly things like that and and that's seemingly i think from your experience and also from what we're witnessing today is like that those those characteristics of democracy is precisely what's being attacked i mean we and it's it's true if we look at washington right now the dysfunction in washington nothing gets through nothing gets done it's the most uh uh, less productive um, uh, Congress in the history of Congress right now, because all they do is fight. You know, it's the talking society, debating uh -huh. society. We can't even say that. I think it's just the yelling at each other society now, you know. Um, and so things don't get done. The roads don't get fixed. Infrastructure falls apart, right? Our foreign policy collapses. And then the, comes the promise that with single government under the, you know, the fewer principle or something that all of this can be taken care of. No more instability, no more chaos. Is that what you saw in, in, in the, with the falling of the Weimar Republic? Well, uh, of course, then there was this law and order. And in the first years of Hitler, people were, many people were satisfied. Um, there was now, the depression was over. People had work. And, uh, uh, for some time, Hitler did even give jobs without preparing war. But then when he started to prepare the war, of course, he dealt uh, very well with the unemployment problem. And so people were in, in good shape. They didn't see the war at the horizon and Hitler's plan to, uh, to uh, colonize the Soviet Union. And uh, they were happy that he would destroy communism. The Catholic Church fell for the fascist temptation because they hoped that Hitler would overcome atheistic um, Bolshevism. They never thought that he really wanted to colonize Russia uh, on a road to Leningrad, on a road to Moscow, and a road to, to Kiev. And then uh, in the network of roads with German farmer soldiers who would control the Slavs as they would do the work. And the Slavs were supposed to have two children and do hard work, be well fed, and but nevertheless were their servants. So uh, that was the whole plan. I don't think Germans were entirely uh, clear about this, but I think the church particularly was very happy what Hitler did when he marched with four million men in the Project Barbarossa into the Soviet Union because of the killing of atheistic communism. So there were a lot of, I well, can't really say a lot, there were numerous movements, groups uh, that opposed Hitler, that opposed um, the fascist temptation that ultimately the Germany succumbed to. Uh, but obviously they weren't successful. They weren't strong enough. Um, why was it? What, what was the reason why these, these movements, like the Confessing Church, for instance, why could they not convince their fellow Germans of the the horrible nature, the, the destructive, the barbaric nature of fascism? Well, they saw the good side of fascism. They saw that their economics, you know, became more stable. They finally saw that Hitler took revenge on all the allies who had di dictated the Versailles dictate and the injustices that he undid all these injustices. Um, so um, there was a lot of good stuff, which uh, people who had been disappointed by losing the war, after making all these sacrifices, they lost the war, the shame, the dishonor, the lack of recognition, the massive reparations, which ruined the whole economy and so on. So the, uh, there was a lot of good stuff which which they followed and they had their own napoleon now uh, up to the march against moscow where the first defeats came there was just one victory after the other so um, that uh, i mean that there was a lot of attractive it makes it understandable why a humiliated nation uh, found in hitler somehow their self-consciousness and their pride in themselves and things like that. So he restored the dignity of the country. At least right. that's what feeling yeah. was. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Do you think he would have remained in power long past 1945 had he not embarked on the disastrous uh, war in the East? Well, 
the war in the, in the East was the core of his whole plan, of his whole thing. So it was the uh, Europe is a small subcontinent with uh, overcrowded to many people. And up there, there are these wonderful fertile, fertile fields in the East. And the Russians never did uh, do enough with all of that wealth they had. And so the temptation has always been to go East and as many people went to Russia, German farmers, as came to the United States. So it was a territory which people were somehow longing for. And so we had the Crusaders marching to Novgorod and killing and murdering until they got there and then sank in the sea. And there was Napoleon with 800,000 people attacking Moscow. And then came Hitler with, four, with his four million. And uh, so um, there is, a, you could say, a natural attraction somehow to these huge, apparently empty territories, which uh, Russians are not taking advantage of somehow. So it is uh, some kind of heritage. But the propaganda is very often that the Russians are a threat. The steamroller, when I grew up, there was always a talk about the Russian steamroller, which would come and roll all over Europe. So we had to do something like a preventive war, a very uh, difficult moral problem. But a preventive war that you foresee that the other will attack and therefore you attack the other. That was what was behind Hitler's story as well. Even in the last stages of the war, my pastor Rudolfi, who was a heroic resistor to fascism and so on, but he still believed that Hitler was the only man who could conquer atheistic communism. So that is why, uh, why then the Vatican made the Lateran Treaty with Mussolini and they made the Reichskonkordat with Hitler, which is still valid today. The priests are still paid in Germany according to the Hitler Concordat. So uh, it reaches right into our presence. And also that people like uh, stations like the uh, Eternal Word, like Fox News and so on, cooperate beautifully with each other. And Raymond Arroyo works in both stations, in Fox News and the Eternal Word. So Catholicism and right-wing movements uh, somehow um, cooperate well. And we have that again now. Um, they never mentioned the Lateran Treaty in the Fox News or so. They never mentioned the Reichskonkordat that is quieted down, but it was a fact that the uh, churches, except the confessing church, um, fell for the fascist temptation. I think you see a lot of that today, right? Obviously, the, what you're talking about, it's, it's almost a parallel to the Weimar Republic, where there that looming communistic threat, you know, to our traditional culture, our traditional way of being in the world. And so we need the great leader who's going to come and champion our cause and, and, and take out the threat. You know, you see that then, obviously, with the Soviet Union and with Hitler. And you see it now, like you're talking about with EWTN and others that would say that, you know, that the, the Democrats are socialists and they're going to destroy our culture with all their progressive politics and our Christianity is under threat and you can't say happy Christmas or Merry Christmas anymore. You have to say happy holidays and political correctness is undermining our, our religiosity. And therefore, we need that strong man like a Donald Trump who will be our champion. He won't even be one of us and not a great religious guy, but he'll be our champion. So almost, you know, a parallel type of situation here. Right. Yeah. And the Democrats are seen as unreligious as uh, atheists and then also as immoral and therefore this concentration on abortion, this possession by abortion. Jesus never said anything about abortions and uh, the eternal word talks about abortion day and night. And even if an execution takes place, they don't talk about the execution. And uh, so if the war is going on, they don't talk about the war. So war and executions are also threats to life, but it is this concentration on abortion, abortion, and so on. It started about 20 years ago or so when I was asked by the bishop how I would teach about abortion in the school. The bishop had no jurisdiction over the university or whatever. But I said, look, I mean, I had eight children. I'm not an abortion man, but 
And then the council said we should have discourse with the secular world about issues. So let's have a discourse and let's see what the outcome will be. So the bishop was quiet afterwards, but somehow that became the focus point of um, church politics to concentrate on this abortion issue. I would personally also be against abortion, but not against criminalization of uh, women or, or doctors or hospitals or whatever. This criminalization is, is fatal in the whole thing. It makes no sense whatsoever. So uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, so that the, it is the enlightened people really who are more in the democratic party. And the struggle between religion and enlightenment has not, start, has not stopped yet. It is still going on. So <clears throat> we have it today that most of our priests are coming from Africa or from India or whatever from less enlightened areas. But what if these areas become enlightened as well? And we have the same problem. So the real problem is how religious people and the enlighteners, uh, the uh, bourgeois enlighteners, the Marxist enlighteners, the Freud enlighteners can come to an understanding with each other. Simply to say they form the devil or whatever, and we are not talking about it and uh, continually arguing, this is Marxist, this is Marxist or whatever. Biden has nothing to do with Marxism whatsoever, and they make him into a Marxist as well. So <clears throat> that is a, a fatal type of a, of a policy. So the uh, religious people <clears throat> can be critical of secular people. Secular people will be religious, uh, to, uh, will be critical of religious people. My son just sent me today uh, an article about a Spanish priest who was murdered by by his uh, by a young man with whom he had sexual relations and so on and so um, this uh, the uh, we have to have mutual critique and coming to a mutual understanding. If, for instance, science has discovered something that the uh, Earth turns around the sun, then science is right and the holy scriptures have to be corrected. There is nothing we can do about this. So. We cannot go on today and say the sun is rising. Well, we go on anyway and the sun is rising, but um, we know that it is not that way. So <clears throat> nevertheless, here is the real problem. We, we could say what already the great philosopher Hegel said, that religion will go under if the Enlightenment will go on and so on. And he was critical of the Enlightenment as well. So here is our main problem. We have maybe half of our population is not ed adequately educated for democracy. And um, so they then throw all their hope to that strong man. He is strong, that's it. If he is moral or not, it's not the real question. The main question is that he is strong. He stands up to Putin, he stands up to the Chinese and so on, and stands up to all the uh, enlightenment in the country. So um, that is our problem this year, in this year. This is a very fateful year in which we find ourselves. Yeah, it seems like, you know, in the U.S. and in other places that people have just grown tired of democracy. Like it, it's, it's almost like it's run its course and they're prepared to let the experiment go and embrace something more certain, something more stronger. And then the other part of the country says, no, we have to protect democracy. It's the best thing we've got. It's the only thing that can secure our, our political rights and things like this. Right. And and so in, in some kind of way, I think we have to talk about, you know, at the heart of this, or at least a, a big chunk of it, at the core of it, uh, is a crisis in capitalism as well. And that when you have the political discussions, no one discusses the the, the capitalistic you know, um, contradictions that are fueling both the sense that democracy isn't functioning and the other sense that said, look, we have to have capitalism. We'll make democracy. Maybe we can just regulate it a little bit. And it seems like those who are most affected negatively by the contours of capitalism are those who are the who blame democracy the most. Yeah. But, you know, the strange thing is that if then uh, Biden, for instance, was successful in some economic issues recently, but people are not disposed anymore to listen to that. No matter what he said, maybe he doesn't say enough, but 
no matter what he says, I have done this and this and this, they don't listen anymore out of a strange, uh, you know, the argument does not work anymore. Now, as far as capitalism is concerned, I think the class issue has been pushed into the background and the waste issue has come into the foreground. The, the Nazis did that in Germany as well. So instead of addressing adequately the class problem which Germany had, they made it into a race problem and made uh, uh, the Jew Jewish high finance responsible for whatever was wrong with capitalism. That is what the Jews had to die for. For, for Rothschild, for Rothschild, they had to die. But Rothschild was in New York. Rothschild was in Paris. He was not in the camps. The camps were Jewish workers. Jewish low bourgeoisie were in the camps and had to die. The high finance, which Hitler uh, three times, he said, when the high, bourgeois, the high finance, Jewish high, Jewish, Jewish high finance will once more instigate a war between European brothers, then that will not be the end of Europe, it will be the end of Judaism. And that was three times. Together with this fanatic expression, there it's only one chosen people. There's only one chosen people. So he wanted to take the place of the chosen people. <clears throat> so, but the main problem, of course, as far as capitalism is concerned, is the appropriation of uh, uh, surplus value. That means that people um, get some of what they work in form of their salaries, but there is something which they produce which goes beyond their salaries. That is the surplus value. And this surplus value is appropriated by a non-working class, a very small class, which then with this accumulation of capital in their hands can pay the parties, can pay the uh, propaganda, can pay whatever they want to. And uh, Aristotle already knew that money would be very destructive as far as democracy is concerned. And we have money issue everywhere. When I was my governance campaign manager, we uh, had made quite some progress with his very enlightened program. And uh, I worked for him and happily I did so. There was a real democratic, in the true sense, democratic statesman. But then suddenly in the middle of the summer, capital came not. The, capital, the businessmen did no longer support McGovern. And then I had to collect money for television shows at least one day a week. And uh, I got $5 from some people, $10 from others. And I could uh, have him on, on the on television maybe once a day. And Wallace, his opponent, he was on television every day. So. Finally, people knew Wallace and they asked who is McGovern. So uh, money plays an unfortunate role in all of this. And so um, that is our real problem. How, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, social democrats coming. They, of course, will tax uh, rich people more and these taxes, with these taxes, they can do good things then. But the uh, ruling class, uh, so Bernie Sanders, for instance, that is democracy or social democracy in Danish or Swedish or Norwegian style. Uh, I don't know if it's the right type of uh, democracy for us. Usually we only think that there is a liberal democracy. We do not recognize that there is also social democracy. So that means when Marx says that there should be dictatorship of the proletariat, that was a very transitional thing in order to break the dictatorship of the uh, capitalists. Uh, but uh, certainly, essentially, this movement was a democratic one. So there's not only liberal bourgeois democracy, there is also a socialistic type of democracy, which is never, never recognized. Because the bourgeois democracy is so formal and not material enough, that is why the uh, working class then had to ask for a better type of democracy, which would include equality and would include freedom and would include brotherhood and sisterhood. Yeah, so I mean, obviously one of, like I said, one, in, like you discussed, one of the core reasons for the disillusionment with democracy is on the financial side, on the economic side, the issues of capitalism and the class structure and class antagonisms. And But there's also something that's come up again and again 
and within these movements that are geared towards authoritarian, far right, even fascist uh, leadership. And that is the the sense of existential crisis, the sense of that there's uh, within democratic capitalism is is paradoxical as that is um that there is no collective projects there is no sense of meaning there is no uh community right no, the the gemeinschaft is is just basically gone and everyone is just a little island unto themselves and here comes this this uh right-wing authoritarian who's going to give you a collective project which congeals people together it becomes a a social ad adhesive um and so i think this also is something that that as at the core of this crisis in democracy as well would you agree yeah that means the uh, democracy as it developed let's see from rousseau the uh, contrat social was some kind of an atomistic type of of a democracy so there is the question of the uh, idea of uh, universality, concrete universality, uh, and then there is the issue of singularity, but somehow the old type of democracy uh, still have the idea of universality, but the modern type of democracy is more atomistic. The individual and the individuals have now no fundamental foundation which holds them together. So like in religion, the Corpus Christi Mysticum, the mystical body of Christ, something which is super is beyond the singularity and the arbitrariness arbitrain of the individual. And so there is something in the bourgeois idea of democracy in which the individual and its arbitrariness is uh, too pronounced in the whole thing and people become um, become isolated, sit in their own houses and so on. When I came over here, he said, you cannot depend on community. The main thing is what you do in your own family and in your own house and, and so on. And so pe people then are concentrated for their family, but there's something missing as far as the, um, as far as the state is concerned. The relationship of the state in, in, is this in our country here, because we did not start out with the state which then divided itself into family and civil society. The civil society was first. Everybody for himself come over here, country without taxes, without military service. So everybody could sit on his farm and not knowing anything of anybody else and such. So um, in, uh, this was an unusual beginning here. And that we put the capital into the swarms of the Potomac River on one side of the country shows already the contempt which they all had to this federal government and to any any uh, particular state government as well. So I think what we have to learn in order to get to the democracy is that we learn citizenship, that we are not only bourgeois who every four years uh, vote in terms of a formal democracy, but that we become democratic in a material in a full and existential sense. So um, that, that is where, what is missing. People uh, think higher of their boss who takes their surplus value from them than they think of the politician or politics or the state or the federal government and, and so on. That is just the government and not the state as a whole. The state as a whole is not even seen, but it's just the government and very often an angry attitude toward the government and even to keep weapons, which everybody else uh, gives the sovereignty of violence is given over to the state and the citizens do not have any weapons anymore because they can trust the state that the state will protect them adequately and so on. So um, there is something which we have to reflect on ourselves. It is one thing to be conscious of the enemy or whatever, it is something else to be self-conscious, to be conscious of oneself and what oneself is doing and what is lacking in ourselves, which we could maybe um, fix, uh, this a terrible word, but which we could, uh, you know, make mature so that we are um, individuals, of course, and 
have full universality, that is wonderful, but that we also learn to be not only bourgeois, but also citizens in the full sense, all four years, and not only every four years. Right, a democratic way of being in the world as opposed to just right. uh, exactly. act or practice or they routinely do, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Um, do you think that the loss of authentic religion, qualified authentic, but the loss of a real meaningful religious way of being in the world where you see yourself in the face of the others, where you believe in your salvation is connected to other people's salvation, to the community's salvation. Do you think the loss of that has something to do with this crisis in democracy? Well, the problem is that many religions are authoritarian themselves, that they have an authoritarian beginning. One can probably say that Jesus was not authoritarian, but in many other religions, you do have this. And then even in Christianity, there was democracy in the beginning. There was uh, socialism in the beginning. But then slowly the monarchical element came through. Um, the, uh, and first of all, the aristocratic element, the bishops, the elders and so on. And then finally the development of the papacy and so on. So we have a strong monarchical element there. We have a strong aristocratic element in the development of Christianity. And then we have a complete disappearance of democracy until recently, where we have a movement under the uh, present Pope, uh, it's a sodality movement, where suddenly bishops and lay people vote together. But there is a tremendous struggle about this. And the main resistance comes from American Catholicism, ironically. So it's American Catholicism, which is most skeptical of this democracy and says we never had democracy and want to have monica, monarchy, the Pope, and want to have aristocracy, but no democratic element, in spite of the fact that the beginning of the church was democratic and communistic. There is this whole hate against communism, in spite of the fact that every order is communistic. All orders have the vow of poverty. All individuals have no poverty. And when St. Francis wanted to have, not even his order was supposed to have poverty, then Pope Innocent III said, no, that doesn't go. The order has to have poverty if somebody gets sick or whatever. So, so radical St. Francis was, and the present Pope chose his name. And um, that was very meaningful. Yeah, and I think choosing that name as well as the policies that you could say that name reflects was also deeply uh, uh, antagonistic towards the very conservative authoritarian nature of a part of the church, especially the church in the United States, which is probably, you know, outside of uh, outside of Europe, one of the most conservative uh, branches of the church, if you will. Right. So do you, shifting gears a little bit, go, go ahead. Hmm? I'll say shifting gears a little bit, um, do you think there can be a viable form of democratic populism to countervail the authoritarian populism? When I say that, I'm thinking about movements like, you know, Bernie Sanders in the United States attempt to run for president uh, two times and in, in the the level of support and enthusiasm he got for someone from people, you know, especially my age and younger, who are looking for an alternative to uh the neoliberal hegemony that we're dealing with here and abroad and that we export all over the place i think about occupy wall street um that movement that seemed to have a, a large outpouring of energy to to change the world to change the context to change what how things are running right now in the both in politics and economics but then they seem to fizzle out they're defeated you know with bernie in a couple elections it fizzles out it comes back up for a quick minute for another something, if we have another candidate like that, which none are on the horizon, and it'll fizzle out. Um, can a democratic form of populism be sustained as a viable countervailing force to the authoritarian forms of populism that we see throughout much of the West right now? Well, I mean, movements are never for, for eternal, for eternity. So movements come up because of a certain issue and, and so on. So 
we had that movement coming up, you know, in the 60s and the 70s. And I worked with all of these students. I was the uh, man in between the universities here in Michigan and, and that radical student movement, the student revolution and so on. And um, many of them were not Marxists, they were Bakuninists, they were anarchists, but no matter if you have the one or the other, you have to have, you have to be educated in it. And it is very hard to, uh, you know, to, for instance, to study what anarchism is all about and why Bakunin opposed Marx and why Marx opposed the Bakunin and so on. And the students did not know exactly who was one or the other and so on. So it needs time and preparation uh, in, on the democratic side. The, you cannot leave it to a king to make the decision. You cannot leave it to an oligarchy or an aristocracy to make the decision, which the American people are used to, this type of uh, 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 aristocracy. Well, really, oligarchy would be better. So very often, the uh, this small group of people who accumulated all the surplus value of the nation with and also doing the politics, and not in a very democratic way, and very often workers then were passive. It is those passive workers, not those who are the real authoritarian group, which is a small group maybe, but that the others are passive and let them happen. That brings about the whole issue. That, that is why finally the victory, why, why they gained their victory because of the passivity of large parts of the working class. So the, uh, the time is short and the work which has to be done in order to become what they call a virtuous, when the founders of our constitution thought that democracy could only work with virtuous people, but that the state could not make them virtuous. So who can make them virtuous? The family and the church. And if they don't do it, then the state has no virtuous people and then democracy becomes an impossibility. So uh, that is our real problem. The, uh, the students then had a short time of three or four years in which they could study those things, but they were so busy then in action on the street that uh, they didn't have much time for studying that neither. They did not only not know what democracy is or what anarchy is or what they did also know, not know what their system is. They thought they lived in a free country. They really believed that. And only when they started acting and hit the barbed wire, and when some of them were shot and so on, then they found out what system they lived in. So, um, and this is, of course, then it was repressed by the Nixonian counter-revolution. And um, all those who uh, had been most active in the democratic movement, they uh, went into the forest, so they became insane, or they adjusted and then became um, functionaries in the capitalistic system. They were the normal people then, and everything was, again, as it was before. So um, that is, we can see from that democratic movement of the 60s and 70s, what happens to those movements. And not time enough, not knowing enough, not knowing enough about the system they want to change. And if you do not know that system, you don't know exactly what you should change. That is communism is statism or whatever. Communism is nothing of that. Communism is the sharing of the surplus value, the end of the robbery. So um, that uh, it is not easy to grasp those things when you have been conditioned in uh, the whole school system to think in a strange, sometimes illusionary way. It is not only that uh, it is only a formal democracy and never was a material one, but even the formal democracy was often uh, threatened the, by these certain parties being financed by certain people. Usually the, the uh, capitalistic ruling class financed both parties because they are both bourgeois parties and they paid them both. And it did not really matter where the president came from and so on because they were sure that they would be faithful to the uh, capitalistic structure. Yeah, I, I certainly. I think also has something to do with the, this cult, at least in the United States, this cult of praxis 
you know, the sense that thinking does nothing, you know, pondering does nothing, theorizing does nothing. You have to go out and do and do and do. And so you have people on the streets protesting, I think, for the right causes or whatnot. But what exactly it is that they're protesting for, as you said, they have no clue. It's just jingoism in that sense. And a certain awareness, you know, how much that took in our evolution that we could think universals and that we came after centuries and thousands of years to the idea of a universal God, not only particular gods, but a universal God. And then also of a universal man and not only particular races or nations or whatever. It was such an unbelievable effort which the human species had to make to come to this point. And so in order to have a democratic movement, you have to have masses of people to come to this point. Because that the elite, the um, human elite has this um, idea, it's not enough. It must be spread among thousands of people who must know that we are all humans, one human species. There are no inferior people. There are no inferior people in Africa who, because they are inferior, you can make them into slaves and so on. Or the Greeks, whoever doesn't speak Greek is not human and so on, and therefore can make it be made into a slave. The slave has not his own ego. The slave's ego is his master. So he is a non-human. So even when people then begin, like Netanyahu said, these are human animals or whatever, then we have bad language and bad language will be followed by bad actions. So this is, this is the problem that, yes, you are definitely right, that we underestimated um, uh, theory because we had to be practical here to, to conquer this, this continent, to build railroads and roads and so on. There was so much practical stuff to be done. So, but we have to catch up. The, we are part of the human species and the human species, unlike animals, has this idea, it is universal. We can think in universals. That means we can think at all. And uh, so, and this universal has to become, become un, in terms of the universal God and the universal man. This idea has to come not only for an intellectual elite, but for all people, for a majority of people, in order to have a democratic movement to rescue whatever democracy we had, in order then to someday to start out from the beginning again. If we have a, if we will have Trump, if we will have an authoritarian structure, it will be like Michigan under Henry Ford. Henry Ford was a fascist and an anti-Semite. He organized the workers of Michigan. They had to have a suit on, a tie on. They had to have a marriage with two children and they had to go to church and they had to get to the assembly line. And if they didn't work fast enough and he turned the assembly line faster, then he had thugs who would beat them up and so on. That would be the fascist regime. They would establish law and order. It's over with going swimming to the Lake Michigan or going fishing or whatever. It will be more disciplined, the whole thing. And so um, it's up to the people, you know. What is it up to the people? See, I had for a long time, I thought that it was not the fault of people that they are not enlightened. I thought the system was doing that to them until I read Kant again, and Kant blamed the people who are not enlightened, that they are not enlightened. It is their own fault. That means they could sit down, instead of going fishing or playing cards, they could do something worthwhile and could uh, orientate them some, so that they would come to the level where then real democracy, formal and material, would be possible. Yeah, I think that's one of the important aspects of the university is to make it known not only to our students to the broader society that that possibility is there that this enlightenment is there now i think about some years ago in a philosophy class when i was giving a lecture and i was probably on you know Nietzsche or kant or something and all of my students were tuned out they just were tuned out and i slammed my book out and i was like where are you guys where are you in your head and I had a student say to me something that was very enlightening. And then they, they said, you know, it's not that it's not that we don't understand this. It's like we've never heard anything like this before. 
like it, we didn't even know this type of thinking existed that these type of ideas existed it was just completely new to them to the point where they couldn't even think about it because for in, the, in their mind it's something that just doesn't exist this type of thought i mean they go you know they, they learn some math they learn a little biology you know they go play football and then they go fishing and that's it the so the idea that there's a world of thought out there which is available to them from from ancient babylon up to the modern period on their phones they have no idea that it's even there but is that their fault or is that the fault of a system right i well, I think the university itself became practical <clears throat> in the 20s, you know, up to the 20s or so. There was theology, there was medicine, there was law, and the humanities. That was all. But suddenly we have the social workers and whatever comes there in, and is also part of the university. So it became more and more practical. And those um, disciplines will concentrate on thinking uh, were somewhat pushed into the background. They were still there, and sometimes they were there only for the richest people, but not for the normal people. So, uh, so there are, you know, even the universities, uh, university has these problems, but we want to see the whole context. I mean, to settle the whole context, whole continent needed a lot of practical people. And there is nothing wrong with the practical people, of course. It is that what is missing, and the missing is the ability and the art of thinking, and not only for a few geniuses or whatever, but for everybody. That in itself is a democratic idea, that everybody should be able to think and to learn that, and it's hard. It can be very hard. So um, we, we know somehow what is going on, but do we have the time you know, I I founded a, 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 I founded a future studies center and it was repressed. I founded a peace study center and it was repressed. I founded a, a ecology center. It's still alive. The two first one fell because they concentrated on society. What had to change in society, and they did not want this. And somebody who did that even before that, a good Jewish thinker who came to this country as a Jewish refugee, he sent 200 people, 100 universities, he sent his proposal of future studies, which contained the democratic element and uh, as, as a centerpiece. And 100 universities said no to it. One, at least, the president asked his faculty. The others didn't even ask the faculty. And the uh, dean who repressed it here at, at Western did not know at all that it had happened before. So it is in the structure of things themselves that people know this is dangerous. But why is the idea of democracy or democratic future so dangerous? Well, because every ruling coup wants to impress the ruled with the fact that they are forever. The slaveholder tells the slaves that the slaveholders will never go. The feudal lords tell the serfs for a thousand years we will never go. And then come the capitalists and say the same thing. And so when the philosopher like Hegel then says, Pantare, everything flows. So the, the slaves go, the feudal lords go, the capitalists go, he becomes dangerous. And then we don't want to talk about him anymore. But we should talk about the Hegel and the Marx and the Freud. They are not there for nothing. So uh, simply to repress them leaves us in an empty space and we cannot think our issues through adequately. And then we become authoritarian. We leave the thinking to the one, the strong one. That's what I hear every day. He's strong, he's powerful, Biden is weak and so on. Well, Biden was weak in terms of Jerusalem, but he was not weak all the time. So. <clears throat> See, um, and everybody can be weak for once. So, but that the strong man will now, because he's strong, will solve everything. That, he, as he said, he would make peace in, in the Ukraine for one day and so on. You can, strength alone will not help. You need thinking too. And you need virtue. That means you need prudence, you need justice. 
you need fortitude, you need chastity, you need the, what, what Aristotle called the, the virtues. Right, all right. Yeah, I did, that's, uh, you know, that's part of that right-wing authoritarian cult of personality is through my sheer will, I can, yeah. bring, uh, you know, peace among these two warring countries, you know, that have had this thousand years of antagonism, but my sheer will and personality can do it. That's that's the magic helper that that you know from talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So uh, last question, because we're running out of time, um, is how do we as as Democrats, small b, p, d, t, people who are dedicated to democracy, formal material, democracy as a way of being in the world, um, also connected to free speech, obviously, because that's a very important part of democracy. How do we deal with those who would use free speech to undermine democracy itself? Do, do we engage in what Herbert Marcuse calls repressive tolerance, um, or which puts limits on democracy, uh, or it puts limits, excuse me, on free speech, um, to, to, to say you cannot use free speech to undermine free speech? But how do we do that? How do we deal with this type of uh, use of the democratic ideals and the democratic promise to undermine democracy. Yeah. Well, I had a Jewish friend, a philosopher in our philosophy department, and he was very radical. He thought that everybody should have that freedom of speech, even those who will kill the freedom of speech when they come into power. They also should still have the freedom of speech. And I rather had Marcuse's position that one should not, one should limit the freedom of speech or that it was limited against those who would undo it if they would come into power. That these uh, heads of these elite universities were called to Washington and that they were asked practically not to follow the freedom of speech was one of the great, quiet, silent catastrophes which had happened have happened in, in recent months. When I was attacked in, in Western Michigan University by Southerners or so because of what I said, and they wanted me to be fired, Western Michigan University said always, we have the freedom of speech. And Professor Siebert has the right to free speech. With this, the university stands and falls that people, when something is uncomfortable, which the student movement will bring up and they clamp down and you cannot talk anymore, then that is, that is tragic for the development of the university and for the whole country. So we should maintain almost at all costs free yes. speech, but also be able to debate where its limits are because, as you said, the dangers of unlimited free speech is yeah. that free speech is then functionalized to kill free speech. It's not absolute. So if you are in a room full of people and you shout fire and they fall into panic and kill each other and so on, you cannot do this. You are not allowed to, so, to say something like that. So there is a limit to free speech, a limit to all of our rights. And so to make it absolute, and then we get a dangerous possible. Right. It always reminds me of, of a democratic yet clever way of dealing with this issue. Happened so many years ago at Michigan State University when a, a white nationalist um, wanted to speak. He was invited to speak on campus. Um, the, the university said, absolutely not. We know who you are. We know what you advocate for. We're a, we're a inclusive, multicultural, uh, pluralistic university. We value our, our students. Uh, we know what you advocate for. So absolutely not. You can't be here. He sued the university. The state then said, you have to give him space and time to speak because you're publicly funded. He's part of the public. And so what did they do? They said, okay, fine. Um, we don't have to guarantee you a prominent place or a prominent time. So they Gates said you can speak on this week, which happens to be spring break. So no students are around <laughs> and we're not going to put you in a prominent, um, you know, speaking place in a hall or something like this. We're going to put you out in our part of our farm campus where they teach, you know, teach uh, young students and animal scientists how to look at horses and cattle and things like this. <laughs> so they put them way out there. It guaranteed his free speech. 
but it also made it so difficult for him to have an audience that only about 50 people showed up. <laughs> That's good, good uh, um, Jesuitism, maybe. <laughs> it is, yeah. So, okay, thank you, Dr. Siebert, we've come to our end and our time. It's been a wonderful discourse, and I think it's something that hopefully we, we clearly need to continue to talk about. Uh, I hope our listeners are inspired to look at uh, this issue more thoroughly and systematically and, and see the crisis in democracy and what we can do to maintain democracy, preserve it, augment it, make it even more democratic, while at the same time not succumbing to the fascist temptation that wishes to overthrow and assassinate democracy. So thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. All right. <laughs>